Can record. That's right. That's right. Okay. Okay. We're looking over there. Yeah. Okay, we're now looking at what is essentially a three plane loop antenna. It picks up a magnetic field, is essentially what it picks up in the textbook functions. It's an XYZ loop that means one runs north south, the other runs east west, and the third runs horizontal. Like this. this one is the north south loop, this one is the east west loop, and this one is the horizontal loop. Now, if we pan it over this way, it's quite impressive. This antenna, no, leave it for a minute. Okay. This antenna covers roughly a frequency range of about 10 hertz up to about 30 megahertz is the frequency range of this. And with this, we can do radio direction finding. Because we can get a, uh, by using a device known as a goniometer, we can get a direction out of the east, west, and north, south loop using quadrature functions. Now if we pan over to the north, sure. you'll see the disc cone antenna. Okay. That is an antenna that is based on a conical function, which is a self-scaling log periodic type antenna. That covers 25 megahertz to 1300 according to the claim of Radio Shack. Actuality, it'll probably cover about 50 megs to about one and a half gigahertz. Okay. Now, if we pan over all the way to the left, I don't know how the camera will pick it up, but you'll see the long wire, which is a typical 13 doublet type dipole. The long wire. See, can we get that? If nothing else, you'll get the insulators going up to it. You'll see there's two wires coming off that top insulator, going off 45 feet in either direction. Yes. That's a dipole. That is also called a doublet. Okay. What or a Hertzian see? dipole antenna. Right. That's an electrostatic antenna. That's an E-field antenna. And that covers, theoretically, down to 10 hertz also, but you have to have very high impedances for 10 hertz which I have, and that goes up to about 30 megs, that antenna. Well, so basically this can be a low wave, a long oh, yeah. wave, oh, yeah. extremely low frequency. Depending upon how you match it out, how you match it up to the receiver. This will transmit down to about 3 megahertz, from 3 to 30 you can match this up to, using a device known as a matchbox. The disc cone will transmit uh, 60 megs to uh, 1200 megs. And then the dual decahedron, dual, the dual octahedron antenna will uh, transmit uh, up to about 20 megs. Okay. And also, this antenna, if you want to pan back to that. Certainly. This one? Yeah. Okay. Let's see? I loosen the pan. Yeah. Turn it. Okay. Good turn. Let's Ooh. focus it back. Okay. Okay. That's good. Good. If you fill in the size of that antenna from coil to coil, what you'll end up with is actually a two pyramids with the bases together and the points one up and point one down. Right. So this can also, for the metaphysicists, this is also a pyramidal type structure, this antenna. Yes. This is the reason uh, Jerry and George here feel like a wind coming off that antenna, because that antenna is pulling out of the sky, pulling out of the ground, and resonating out. Okay. Yes, yeah, a very powerful pressure sensation. Yeah. That antenna is an accumulator in itself. Okay. George, where do you seem to feel the pressure? Feel pressure at any particular point? No. Okay. Well, I was feeling it off of the corners. Um, right off the corners of the, uh, the cell itself. Very powerful sensation. And this is the antenna set up for space time laboratories. We use this for monitoring. Okay. With this setup, we can monitor uh, 
10 hertz to about 1.2 gigahertz, although I have receivers that go up to 2 gigahertz. Okay, I guess we shut this off and go downstairs. How about this one? Okay. Uh, could I could I ask you a question about uh, the other antennas? How do they figure in any kind of uh, let's say radionic or psychotronic functions? I mean, are you well, able to pull signal? This one tr will transmit almost a pure scalar. And now we're mm -hmm. you're talking about the uh, the long wire. The long wire. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see if we can focus. It's hard to see the long wire for the trees, but <laughs> it's well on the camera either. On the that's uh, okay. Camera. Right, it's there. It's just above the treetop yeah. level. You can see you it. You should see the white insulators right in the sun. Right. 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 Okay, pick it up. Okay. Coming close to the center, I can pick it up at least 50 feet away. Right. Yeah, this is the thing I felt coming up uh, the ladder. Especially for some reason, uh, I feel it especially from this point. Speak up, Jerry. Okay. <laughs> I feel uh, I feel the pressure very powerfully from this point in particular. Is there a reason for that one? I mean, the other seems to be kind of. Hey, you gotta remember, you're at the cold juncture of the third here. Yeah, what's this? You're at the cold juncture of the point. Right. So this point, I don't know, personally it seems to be the most powerful to me anyway. Each people, each person will feel a little bit differently. Okay, that's interesting. You know, human senses do vary from human being to human being. Certainly, certainly do. This is the problem with parapsychology. You know, what do you call a standard? Yeah, this is, this is true. I've often thought that the differences that people uh, confess or uh, receive um, should be added to. In other yeah, words, if you everybody. you move over there, you sure. get a different view of it. Yeah. You got a pause? Sure. How's it look? Okay, very good. Oh, yeah, we got it. Yeah. Okay. Here we see the parallel transmission line leading up to the dipole. We use this instead of coax cables because this type of line is better for carrying etheric or relativistic functions. This is not as lossy. Yes. Uh, it does seem uh, pretty significant to me that um, the early researchers who investigated this kind of phenomenon um, develop these kind of devices first. This is the this is the etheric transmission line. I don't know if you can focus in on that. Okay. Yeah, we can see that. Okay, this is a specially designed transmission line for etheric signals. You'll notice this is like a specialized plastic for the semiconductor. And this is a solid aluminum sheet. It's not braided. You see it's a very heavy cable that quite closely resembles the cable leading up. This is what you have to use in UHF and VHF structures. Because open transmission lines don't work all that well. And you'll see that line at the base of this antenna over there. Okay, let's swing around. And we're looking at the base of that tower. At you'll the base see of the, the tower. Transmission line I just showed you. Absolutely, it's wrapped around the bottom there. Mm -hmm. okay. And that goes up. If you want to pan up, you can see that goes up to this cone for the UHF and yes. VHF signals. Right. Excuse me for. <laughs> okay. Straight up this way, and we'll pull back. Lovely view. Lovely view. And then if we pan over towards the, you can get another view of the uh, pyramid of the plant. Surely. You see the work in process, Surely. you see the work in process table. Okay. And you can see all the wires coming to the base of it. All right, let's go over here.
Yes, we will. That's quite a wrap. How long did it take you to splice there? About 20 minutes? You got to it. Three hours. It looks organic. This is one of our termination pods. You can see all the wires. Okay. Can you zoom in on that? Yes. Yes, we are. This is the termination for all the loops in here. This is for the horizontal loop. We have three of these. So if you can come in and zoom in on the table, yeah. you can get a good shot of the table, you can see the different pods. You know, all the wiring. Okay. That's lovely work. It's lovely and complicated work. And that still was in process, that one. Yeah. I wanted to uh, bring out and emphasize the idea that the early research is working by intuition mostly, um, seem to develop these etherically active devices rather True. fluidly. And then when the engineers seem to get a hold of it, they uh, selected out certain functions in the signals and eradicated the others. What mm -hmm. do you feel about that? I agree with you. Well, we can go more into that when we get out of the sun and get downstairs in the shop. Okay. All right. Let's just take a last look at this beautiful antenna. Yeah, lovely reporting your neighbor's dog. Okay. <laughs> That's the atmosphere of the dogs barking well, in the it's background. Well, it's, it's real. Can you show us the Rogers antenna downstairs? Yeah, that'll okay. be downstairs. Love to see that. Okay, we'll pick up in a second. Okay. Okay, what we're looking at here, I know it looks like two black wires coming out of the ground. Can we outline them? Yes. Here and here. And then we got a wire leading off there. What this is, at the turn of the century, Larry Rogers, I think it was Larry Rogers, designed what was called the Rogers radio system. This was essentially his concept, was to take a coaxial antenna structure and bury it. And one day, about eight months ago, we had a ditch switch here, and we dug a ditch that went this way and went that way. It goes to either end of the property, and this is the center point. Okay. This wire goes into the ground and goes that way. This wire goes into the ground and goes that way. And it's a double on the ground. That's all it is. Okay. This goes into the receiver room, and we can listen to the signals that are in the earth itself. The Navy used this type of thing as an emergency communication to the submarines for years and years and years, because this could reliably transmit a signal or receive from the submarines. Okay. Because the ocean is part of the earth. Right. You know, there is much less reflection angles from the earth, you know, from dirt to the ocean than from ocean to air for airborne signals like the other antennas we looked at. Okay. Now that goes down about three feet, right? It's about uh, three feet down. Okay. Now simply by submerging the cable... Um, we put it inside the earth and we're using the earth here as a meteor of transmission and reception. Right. This will tell me what signals are in the earth. Okay. Yes, this is impressive. Also, um, how insulated must these wires be? Very highly insulated. I used that etheric transmission line and buried it and connected up the center cable and let the outer cable float. So you look see. at the original Rogers pattern, he had a steel pipe. And then down the center of the steel pipe, you put a, the actual antenna inside the center of the steel pipe. Okay. Which is a coaxial structure. So a coaxial okay. cable does the same thing very nicely. Right. Okay. We're focusing on you a little. But essentially, he took a steel piece of pipe and just suspended a wire in the center of it on insulators. I see. And then buried this whole thing okay. in the air. So that's all we can say on the wires. You got a wrap here. Okay.
Okay. Now we go inside. President of this antenna. Yes, sir. I felt. I'm standing about, uh, about 100 feet from the antenna. Okay. Check the focus on it. Yes. This is where I normally can pick up. Pick up the antenna. The power of the antenna. At different times. As this resonates, different waves. I felt it here. Okay. Now, from the point about 25 feet away to here yes. is normally the strongest when I could first pick this up. Right. And as I go cl closer to it, um, it gives me a whirling sensation. The sense of whirling sensation. Can you describe the symmetry of the whirl in your body? <coughs> Um, is it something that goes around you? I feel myself whirling. You feel yourself whirling. Whirling. In which direction is it facing us? Normally, like right to left, counterclockwise. 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 Okay. That's interesting. I uh, I had a physiological effect when we came onto the grounds. As we approached the antenna, as I caught sight of it, uh, I felt the pressure of the wave against my body, uh, like a flattening effect. It was flattening me out, kind of, uh, at around uh, heart level, maybe around solar plexus level. As we got closer to it, it kind of uh, impacted me in my facial area and the throat area. Um, but there was another effect, and it was a sensation of being bloated. Um, sort of like your uh, internal organs, just getting the sensation of uh, just a gashy uh, bloatedness suddenly out of nowhere. So it has physiological effects. Okay. I feel at this point, this is where uh, uh, it's strongest. Okay. A from a distance away from it. From 25 feet away, normally I could feel uh, the impulse from 25 feet up the driveway into the front door here. But uh, this is this is the strongest. This is why I'm concentrating right here. This is a great yeah. Um, yeah, this is really the kind of material we're looking for today also with a lot of the material within the laboratory. Okay. That's very good. Thank you, George. Now we move inside. Okay. We begin. Well, we're now inside space-time laboratories. Maybe you want to put it on pause and start again. Hello, Preston. Okay, we are now in the monitoring room of Space Time Laboratories. That is Preston Space Time Laboratories. Over here, as you just saw on the pan, we have a wall of radio receivers. All those antennas you just saw come to this panel right there. These are patching the different antennas into the different receivers. Okay. And from the panel, I can select the antenna input of any of these receivers. This selects the audio that you hear some of right now with any of these receivers. Right. This is audio control and processing here. And if you go up towards the ceiling, Jerry, you can see yes. the speakers on the ceiling on the ceiling. Right. This is patterned after the older style HF receiving stations used by the different communications companies for Trans uh, Ocean Broadcast and Transcontinental Broadcast. Trans uh, Ocean Broadcast and Transcontinental Broadcast and such. Except I'm using this here to pick up unusual functions. Way for want of better words, of the better known as HF communication for about 30 years, and I know everything that's out there because I've heard it. And I'm looking for functions that are unusual. I can recognize teletypes, I can recognize facsimile by sound, I can recognize voice, I can recognize CW, I can recognize Morse code. But as we scan across the bands, probably even now we'll pick up some very unusual functions. Yes. Which we can go to right now. Wonderful. 
事情。Single side band. That's facsimile. That is more Morse code. There's teletype. Here's international broadcast. You can understand that you could. This is international broadcast. Let's widen bandwidth again. More silly side bands, single side bands. That's a local oscillator from one of the other receivers. I call it a birdie. That's a beacon. Tell us about that. That's what somebody transmits when they want to keep their frequency clear for another person's purpose. You'll also find these as maybe two or three carriers, and you may have teletype on the center carrier. In fact, if I go to CW, is the government's on the air. Thank <laughs> you. 
was a government function right there. That's one of their psychoactive signals. <laughs> what happened? Did that drift out? No, they come on very short periods. <laughs> At some point, can you describe uh, the effects of these psychoactive uh, transmissions? Well, let's first see if we can find one. Okay. <laughs> During that brief sound, George, did you uh, happen to feel anything? No. No? I felt sort of like a, uh, sort of like a, uh, an anesthetic feeling. Kind of uh, wipes your senses out for a second. No, I can't listen to these for long periods of time. Five minutes for me is enough. All of them? In general? Yeah. These, uh, these broadcasts are sporadic throughout the day. Nothing is really, uh, uh, there's no sequence you can follow. Uh, I can turn... You just have to look. That's all. Yeah, right. Sometimes I'll catch them early in the morning, sometimes late at night. Sometimes not at all. Okay. There's no uh, set patterns that uh, you can do anything. Okay. Ah, there it is. There we are. That's what we call the American woodpecker, or the American buzzsaw. If we wait long enough, it'll be back. Yeah. Okay. It's a, very, uh, it's a very annoying and very unusual sound. I yeah. sense it physically. As it is, I, uh, I haven't heard anything else like that on the air. Okay. Just like the other signal, that one just came and went. Yeah, right. Okay, very short pulse, you know, of uh, <laughs> So we know they're up in the 20 megahertz region. So if we scan, we may find them. They hop different frequencies. Okay. I'm sensing a very powerful uh, presence with each uh, signal you tune in. Oh, yeah. It seems to fill the room with a presence. It's almost like uh, transportation of sorts or like uh, trans-dimensional viewing. Um, I wonder if, uh, if if you've noticed the same thing. Um, well, I'm not sensitive myself. I've worked around these fields all my life, so I've developed natural immunity to it, okay. and I, I don't feel them. This got to be practically a atomic bomb going off before the first time. I've been able to feel myself somewhat from there. Is this one right there? No. Yeah. Well, uh, they came and went. Yeah. This is the way they transmit. Very sporadically for like maybe minimum two seconds, maximum about a minute. And, and there'll be at different frequencies each. This is the way they transmit. Very sporadically for like maybe minimum two seconds, maximum about a minute. And, and there'll be at different frequencies each time. Okay. Can you define the function of these things as, as you've ascertained them? Or uh, do, you, do you lack information on that? It's a... It's essentially a pulse carrier, you know, a square type pulse with all sorts of other pulses, sinusoids, portions of a sinusoid, and all sorts of transforms, you know, different frequencies mixed in it. Okay. You listen to that pulse, you can hear that's a wide variation of modulation. Okay. That covers from uh, bass all the way up to the highest treble. The bandwidth is about 30 kilohertz that they transmit, 30 to 50 kilohertz. Can you... Um, the basic rep rate is about 40, 30, or 40 hertz. Okay. Can you tell us anything about the content of these signals? Well, we have a number of psychics around, like George, for instance. Another one is an associate of mine who works here at Duncan, who can actually sense what these signals are doing. And <coughs> from time to time, they transmit either general psychic disruption you know, where you can't do any readings or anything, or they have been also targeting individuals. This network 
that we're talking of is essentially a group of radio transmitters spread around the country. And you may hear the output of three or four transmitters on the same frequency. Yes, you, can, you can pick on us spatially by looking at the vectors as they come in that they got maybe three or four transmitters transmitting at the same time, one after the other, this sort of thing. And they did target an individual that's uh, affiliated with here where we could actually go in with a handheld detector and pick up the solitons it was creating and we traced it to the signal. And we had it one night where the signal was locked in on the same associate of ours and through the use of these receivers, which I don't want to go into how at this point, we removed the targeting from him to the receivers and then this served the timing and so followed up the timing it went off the air and it didn't come back in that mode for quite a while. This is an interactive signal that picks up something from the point they're transmitting to because we could actually affect the timing by how you tune the receiver. As you tune through it, you can you, you can affect the timing. You probably know that, George. As you tune the receiver, you, you can change it by how you tune the receiver back and forth as you turn the dial a little bit more. So it is definitely an interactive function. Now, you were talking about a presence in the room. Yes. Absolutely. If we turn on this receiver here into this speaker, this is the one that make the presents. It's a very powerful presence. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like you're there. This is an old design, this receiver. No, it's this one. You can feel the energies right from the broadcast. Yes. It's very warm. It's a velvety sensation. It's right up close to you. These are all vacuum tube receivers. Yes. This one's older design. This is a Moray design, this one. <laughs> the Henry Moray. Be well, if we can widen this one out. The signals are very warm. They feel warm. You know. What I mean by warm is they feel very emotionally uh, dense. It's almost as if the longer you allow the sound to permeate the room, if uh, you were sensitive to your own thought process, you probably could uh, get flashes of the transmission point. In other words, where the signals are coming from uh, would actually transmit a visual whole image to you. I've yes, experienced that. Have you ever experienced yes. that? I haven't, but other senses I've been working with can get full pictures. Yeah. Marvelous. I'm trying to find something in English. Now, these signals are being received through the multi loop? On no, the these are long wires. From the long wire. Okay. The former governor of Gibraltar is being treated for gunshot wounds and is sent by a spokesperson for the staff they are very nice general trainer. hospital to be yes. sent on almost a purely etheric signal. Really? Because well, it comes they through very clear. Very yes, it does. That's if you tune this in on a solid state receiver, it wouldn't come in that clear. Why is that? Describing the, the, the this receiver is picking up the etheric function of the relative time, she ran the police. This receiver is about 1935. Okay, so he's in. Held senior army positions in West Germany and Belgium. 
should have continued into their retirement. In civilian life, should have been possible. Well, you know, this, this has something you don't hear in the modern day receivers. Just go stand right under that speaker. I know. I can go from here. Yeah. It's a presence. It's almost like a three-dimensional presence. Not for people's homes. It's like being widened. It's like. Now, out of office. Yeah. It's, it's like being right in the room with us. Lady Betty Terry, speaking for the first time since the attempt on her husband's life. The leader of the Scottish National Party, Mr Gordon Wilson, has delivered his farewell address at the party's annual conference. Mr Wilson, who is stepping down from the leadership... Uh, is it possible to tune in to whistlers and earth signals? Uh, that would be on this receiver here. This receiver isn't fully operational yet. Of the 72 parliamentary constituencies in Scotland, the Nationalists hold four. This is the ELF receiver right here. Yeah, I filled in the whistle is with the ELF receiver, which is this one. Yes. This one isn't fully set up yet. Okay. This one still was in process. Can you demonstrate for us the um, uh, Rogers antenna versus the uh, aerial? Okay. We could do that. Let's turn this back on, okay? Sure. This is seen as an important part of Scotland's heritage. This is now the background there. Scots. Our Scottish Affairs <laughs> as one of the delegates gave a flavor of the Irish when he announced the war. you know that it's clear. This conference caused it's weaker, but it's clear. to stand as metal seller and you'll know that the other the day. Scots lead as to the Gallic lead. Okay, this Indeed. is the Rogers and This is the Rogers. That motion calls for as much money as metal seller to be given to the Scots language as that recently announced for Gallic. Ansel Cameron, convener of the Scots Heritage Society, will be speaking in the debate, recognizes parity is unlikely. You remember on the above ground, you can hear it fading in and out. Tongue. It is true. Insists a language distinct now this is the same BBC signal we were just listening to. England, the Gallic, oh, this is wonderful. This is the, this is the above ground. Okay. Now there's a different presence to this. But you're a You can hear like the fading roll. If you see, it's Bell Street. That is very much more effective than seeing. Yeah, and there's a hollow quality about it. The campaign has become the language which once was spoken as far south as Doncaster. It's a weaker signal. You can hear the, the noise of the receivers come up. Academics. But it's a cleaner signal. The financial news is... Yes, it's denser. It's the more solid. Yes, it's a denser signal. It's a high fi. There was a deep fade. That army was above ground where we were doing incorrect. Here it is. It's a very and double that next year if the crisis continues. Back Our economics correspondent reports from Washington. The countries which are yeah, yeah, you, you were trying to cash in on the above ground. Yeah. Neighbors, certainly in 1990. The countries which are yeah, yeah, you, you were trying to cash in on the above ground. Yeah. Neighbors, certainly in 1991, Jordan turned. Yeah, what I'm sensing in the room is a, it's a denser signal. It's, there's more presence to it. It's less hollow than your above uh, ground signal. Okay. Now, any transfer of this ground will send the signal into the air to heat and pick up. Okay. Uh, the question I have is, does the Rogers antenna come into better uh, clarity with decreasing frequencies because the as you get lower, does it get better? No solution to the crisis next year. Taking into account the early effects of the crisis, the consequences become. You know, as I say, it gets differentiated. It's very sharp sound. And the, the remittances that yes. traditionally had been sent home by foreign workers there. The total cost here reached okay. more than six thousand million dollars. Apart from the so-called so frontline states, states the main victim is Sri Lanka. I think we uh, touched upon it now. George, do you have anything to add? Okay. Well, not really. Maybe a last look. Mm -hmm. I think I this marvelous marvelous place. <laughs> yes, indeed. A lot of work went into this phone. How many tri uh, how many receivers do you have here, approximately, Preston? I don't know. I've lost count. <laughs> <laughs> wall to wall. Mostly helicrafters. Well, this one is a military made by Motorola. This one is a Raycal. This one's a Raycal made in Britain. 
This is this is HF short wave. This is VHF and little UHF made by Motorola for the government. Yes. This is made by Collins for the government. This is VLF receiver. Yes. This is an HF receiver. This is also made by Collins for the government. This is a Hamerlin. This is an SP600. This is you see is my main receiver. It's so easy to work with and tool. Yes. This is another Collins receiver made for the government. Mm -hmm. This is a Hamerlin. This one is an amazing receiver here. This is a TRF regenerative shortwave receiver made for the government. This is another Hamelin here. Yes. Um. This is another Collins yes. made for the government. This is a National. This is VLF again. And then this is a, this is either known as a NEMS Clark or it's known as a LTV receiver, or it's known as a Watkins Johnson's <laughs> receiver. Okay. Whatever you want to see. You know, it's all the same company. And they're all vacuum tube. Yeah. They? Okay. Now, this is UHF and microwave, this one here. Although this is the whole range. This one starts at 10 megahertz and goes to 30. This is 30 to 300 megahertz. This is 30 to a gigahertz, 30 megahertz or gigahertz. And this is 1 gigahertz to 2 gigahertz. Yes. These are the ELF twins. These receive ELF. This is made by Federal Telephone and Radio Corporation pre-World War II for the government, for the Navy. This is known as an RBA. This is an RBB. This is an RBC. These three make up a whole receiving system that goes from 15 kilohertz to about 27 megahertz. Right. This is another British rate cow. This is the two version of that first receiver I showed you, which was a solid state rate cow. Okay. And then that behemoth up there is out of commission right now. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit more about the Moray design? Well, back in the 30s and the 40s, T. Henry Moray worked as a consultant to the radio industry. He worked mainly for E. H. Scott, Inc. Not H. H. Scott, E. H. Scott. But after he worked for, for E. H. Scott, he designed the famous Philharmonic, the famous Imperial. You know, those big, ma massive, grand consoles of the 30s with chrome plated chassis and right. picked up local AM radio stations like their FM and this sort of thing. Later, he went to Harrowin and, and designed the Super Pros. Yes. This is your first Super Pro. The Comet Pro was in the other room. With what I have another term for that. I call that the Vomit Pro. Oh, <laughs> this is the first good Hamerlin receiver, and this was designed directly by T. Henry Moray, okay. just as the old Scots were. Mm -hmm. this, has, uh, this has input from Nikola Tesla in it, this one, because Tesla worked for RCA uh, Global Communications. Can you tell us the years and the name he worked under? Okay, this this is about a 1935 design. So is this. Okay. And Tesla, his nephew, who was I think William Turbo, hired Nikola Tesla, but hired him under the name Nikola Turbo. If you want to find information on Nikola Tesla RCA, you look for Nikola Turbo, because when he was hired by RCA, he was in re he was in ill repute. Yes. The guys wanted to use his genius, but they didn't want his name in the corporation. So he could legally use the name Turbo, so he did. Yes, this is fascinating. Most people think that towards the end of his life, uh, he was penniless and... Uh, <laughs> oh, he was very much different from being penniless. Tell us about that. Well, he rented the top floor of Oak Hotels, the New Yorker. He rented the top floor of the New Yorker, and he rented both penthouses on the New Yorker and the uh, Waldorf Astoria. He used one penthouse for a transmitting station and the other penthouse for a receiving station. <laughs> they had his lab in the whole top floor of the New Yorker. That's not cheap. I, know. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. No, it's not cheap to rent the whole top floor of the New Yorker. Now, you had a direct input into this discovery. You've been doing a lot of... Um, Archaeology, more or less, Essentially. Uh, uh, and in, in radio antiquities. So, could you tell us a little bit about that uh, incident, about that time period, how you discovered this? Okay, I've been, as you can see here, while you're looking up here, you can see older and older receivers. 
Yeah. I am also a vintage radio collector, but my specialty is communications equipment. Yes. And I had an opportunity to go to the old, I think it was the New Yorker Hotel, before they refurbished it. Remember yes. it was closed down for years? Yes. It was right. either one off of the New Yorker, right? I think it was the New Yorker. It was the New Yorker on okay. the west side. I was able to get into that hotel and look it over before I was before they ripped everything out. Yeah. And you can see the remnants of Tesla paraphernalia on the top floor. And in the penthouse, I found a whole row of these RCA receivers, yes. which I couldn't get out, but I knew where to get them. Yes. You know, I had photographs of them, and of the Tesla receiver, and they were no different from what was built for RCA. I did manage to get that transmitter out. Okay, maybe we can... Of one of the penthouses. May we focus on this? Sure. Okay, because this, this, this is a fascinating bit of lore. We'll move around this way. Come on over here, Terry. Caught, okay, you got it. Yeah. Okay, I've been referring to this as the re-emergence of Nikola Tesla. We were led to believe that he was destroyed by the Morgans and just kind of turned into a non-person, thrown out into the streets where he lived on a stipend, uh, wearing one suit a year and living like a poor. Which is far from the truth. Tell us more. Well, when I got into the New Yorker with a group of people from a vintage radio organization, looking for radio history. We found all sorts of assorted odds and ends and junk on the top floor. It was definitely electrical junk. None of it was useful for anything. It was all broken up pieces of this, that, and the other thing. But the two penthouses were very interesting. The pen one of the penthouses had a big cabinet with a radio transmitter in it. I brought out the RF section and there it sits right there. Tesla used this for something. I'm not sure what he did with it. The other penthouse was filled with giant racks of these huge receivers that I got other, you know, I got in the other room, but there's no power to connect the camera to shoot it. Yes. Although you can focus on pictures of them that I have. Okay. And Tesla used these receivers. The folklore has it that he was talking to the ETs of these things. How true that is, I don't know. There's a lot of folklore about Tesla talking to ETs, and then in the later years, his developments were ET inspired. But who knows for real? Right. What about his involvement with the electric car and wireless transmission of power, um, psychogenerative uh, beam signals, etc.? How did that relate to this kind? Of well, he probably was transmitting psychoactive signals with this. Okay. Because this uh, transmitter has signals, etc. How did that relate to this kind? Of well, he probably was transmitting psychoactive signals with this. Okay. Because this uh, transmitter has modifications in it that are similar to the ones I use here to transmit psychoactive signals. I see. In fact, it's very similar. After I made the modifications, I brought this back. I studied this. I realized, hey, uh, I'm not the first one to do this sort of thing. Okay. Anything unusual you saw in the circuitry there, perhaps, you could mention? Uh, what it is, it's more the ratios of the coils and the capacitors and the inductive the resonant networks and the way things are laid out. The whole lower chassis in this transmitter, which is the driver, the frequency generator and driver, has been completely redesigned because this is a standard federal radio telephone like this receiver here, yes. made by the same company. This is a standard shipboard transmitter. And I have full set of uh, manuals on it. And that lower chassis is nothing. You know, front looks the same, right. but the lower chassis in the point. back is, right. is has been entirely redesigned. Okay. Not even using the same tubes. You even changed the tubes. Okay. 6L6s are not all that great at high frequencies. Okay. But he's got them in there. The thing originally used uh, a weird tube, but that whole bottom chassis has been rebuilt. So we're looking at a piece of Nikola Tesla machine. Okay. The receivers were in very bad shape because all the windows in the penthouse were gone. They were all open, they were covered with pigeon dirt, and they were rusted and this sort of thing. But this, 
was sort of in a room all sealed up by itself. Now with all the windows are out of that penthouse, you can see whatever you use for a control mechanism to this thing was worthless. It was all rusted, gutted, and but this I knew in the penthouse there was a corner that was blocked off. And I found how to open the door and there was this nice transmitter still in beautiful shape. Okay. So, so this is a transmitter? Yeah. We okay. carried out the RF section. We left the transformers because you know transformers are standard. Okay. Also, the elevator wasn't working. Ah. So my friends and myself, we had to carry this downstairs from about the seemed like the fiftieth floor. There was there was four of us. We all took turns carrying this thing down the stairs. It's carrying other stuff down the stairs that the other fellows wanted. It's a beautiful piece of machinery. Okay. Beautiful. Maybe you want to shoot the back of it too. That sounds like a good idea. We're in position. Would you like to say some more about it? We can see the well, coil. Well, you can see here we have what appears to be a standard radio transmitter. The only thing is you got to look at the details of the construction of this chassis here. Underneath? Yeah. This chassis is built different from what it was originally designed. The upper section is standard. Of course, you can't tell by looking at it. You'd have to actually schematic it out and you'll find that the circuit is entirely different from uh, what came from the factory. So, it's nice work. It's beautiful. You know, he did a nice job on it. Whoever did it for him, if he didn't do it, did a nice job. But 6L6s aren't strong enough to drive a pair of 813s. Usually you need something like an 837 to drive 813s or something like that. Can you talk a little about his uh, electric car? That seems to occupy a lot of people's um, imagination. Is well, I have personally that? talked to people that were descendant from his lawyer. Now, I've seen the electric car. Yes. And I'm still trying to find out where it is. It's I'm still, still tracking it. I see. I don't know if it still exists, but I'm trying to find out what, what, what actually happened to it in the end. Where did it go? Was it destroyed? This sort of thing. I haven't been able to find it. For all we know, this may be the transmitter that transmitted to the electric car. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what he did. And interestingly yeah. enough, this is psychically clean. There's no images on this. I'm sure even George could have testified mm -hmm. that this thing is clean. Yeah. Okay, in other words, whatever signal it's transmitting, it's pure. And there's no residuals in it. Uh, meaning? There is no... You turn on a radio transmitter. Yes. You can feel images from here. Let me go get a small radio transmitter. Line. Okay, here we got two transmitters. The old Tesla transmitter. Yes. And this old military transmitter. Yes. Now, I'll guarantee both of them have been used. Right. This set has been used. Yes. We know that set has been used. Yes. But I'm sure both of you gentlemen, being, uh, being sensitive and being able to pick up fields, can testify that that has all sorts of information stored that it, Sorry, but no that doesn't. Right, I do feel that. I do sense that. Yeah, it's very busy. Yeah. Yeah, it, sounds, it feels like this one's See, been whenever used. you turn these things on, right. it leaves residuals of what went through them, the information. I see. This is fun. A good so psychic. Somewhat of a wave pulsation yeah. to it. Yeah. A true psychic can read what this has sent. Yeah, this is noise. There's nothing on that. Yeah. This is clear. The Tesla transmitter. The tra Tesla transmitter is clear. Somehow, he's got this self-clearing. I don't know how. That's the reason I'm sitting here, because I'm still studying it. I see. Trying to figure out why is this self-clearing, and this is not, for instance. What about the transparency of the device to the signal, maybe? I don't know. How transparent the materials? Are, are the materials radically different? No. No. Not really. It's aluminum, copper, steel, ceramic, tubes. Well, there's something's in it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this one feels like uh, I'm getting a time too. I'm getting a time. Yeah, like about the free 50s. World War. Well, no. yes, this could have been used up into the 50s. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Because this was, yeah, this was built in the late 40s. Okay. 
Yeah, not be, not not into the 60s. No, but certainly up until the middle 50s. A lot of activity. Well, this was replaced by the GRC9 in the mid 50s. Okay. So they only used these up to the middle. It's 50s. very noisy. There seems to be, uh, if I can just step sure. into the field here, there seems to be a lot of noise around these functions. Here. Well, you're at the oscillator end. These components yeah. right here. That's the oscillator. This is kind of, it's going in. The signal feels like it's going in and like really Okay, you are here. picking up the conjugate return that's coming back into the transmitter. That's interesting. Okay. That's the image you talked about when we were on the roof. Right. The way the receiver acts like a transmitter mm -hmm. and the transmitter acts, acts like, like a receiver. receiver. It's right. fascinating. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something that uh, I mentioned on the roof before and didn't fill in. Uh, it's, it's been a theory of mine, maybe you can, we can bat this around the room. Uh, a lot of people think that because two, three, four or more uh, psychically sensitive people uh, are picking up different things, that that means they're all wrong. Not and necessarily. Definitely does not mean that they're all wrong. It means that they're all picking up something Possibly in different resonant levels. Well, for instance, on this, how many messages would you guess that mm. the army sent with that? Lots. So there's something of every message in there. Yikes, yeah. A different psychic may pick up on a different message. Right. And if you read it, if I was to bring in 50 psychics, I bet you'd get 50 different readings. Uh, if I could pick up a place on the East Coast where the signals were coming out of? It's me, I don't know. Maryland, maybe? I have no idea. I'm just trying to cite this thing. This, this, this I picked up at what's known as the Ham Fest, which is a ham radio flea market. Okay. Where hams go to sell off their excess junk. And what, where that came from, where it was used, I don't have the positives. Okay, that versus this. But the unusual part of this unit is this is clean. Yes, this is the Tesla transmitter now. A beautiful piece of work. The tubes are very large. Can you describe these transmitter this tubes? This standard 813s. Okay. All the tubes are standing in this. Yes. They're right out of RCA. There seems to be a very powerful signal just going right through this coil. That's the main tank coil. Yeah. That's yeah. what goes to the antenna. That and coil. the signal doesn't seem to be transverse. It seems to be a longitudinal mm -hmm. signal. Boom. That's the relativistic right. function of the transmitter. This is from the 30s also, by the way. Okay. Should we fade on this? Sure. Okay. Anything else to add? Well, we go in the, uh, the green room. Okay. We'll do. One last look. One last look. Don't you fade on George. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I'm going to have to fade out. George, yeah. you're feeling tired? Well, I have, uh, I have some commitments. Okay. Alright. Okay, we're now in the storage room, the goody room of Preston Space Time Laboratories. This is where I store all the stuff I'm not using at this moment. We don't have on display. If you turn around behind you over here, you see our transformers. Yes. Hi, President. Hi. We see our transformers. Okay. For you as an audio man, all these, this whole bottom shelf, this shelf here going all the way over is nothing but output transformers. Right. You know what they are for tube amps, right? Yes. See, we got a good collection of output transformers. Then if we go over here, this way, the rest of them are power transformers, essentially. We go over here. These are audio transformers. They're well stocked. Very well stocked. <laughs> you can see now. You can just walk down and shoot down each aisle. Okay. How many years has it taken you to collect all of this material? This is probably about twenty years. Twenty years. And I suppose most of this material is already. Impossible to replace or yes, get? Yes, most of it's impossible to replace. Yes. Okay. Okay. 
It's this, quite the, clear for you. this is the library. Yeah, part of the library. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Keep going. There's more. You shoot the transformers again from a different angle. Yeah. Mammoth stockpile. There's an aisle here you missed. You missed this aisle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, as long as we don't say anything, it's all right. All right. <laughs> okay. There's all sorts of goodies hidden in here. They're wonderful looking. All sorts of antiquated devices. Mm-hmm. And new devices. And new devices. There are newer devices here, sure. Yeah. Uh, have you ever done any kind of study on lightning rods? No. I'm very interested in in recovering used lightning rods which have been struck. Well, why don't we shoot down this aisle? Okay. Hey, you're running out of cord, but I guess you can get a good look. Yes. Now, if you shoot down the ceiling, you'll see our parallel transmission line. See, it comes in there. Yes, right here. Through the bosom insulators. Right, I see the... the grounding switch. Right, I see the switches. And then it just comes around, curly tunes, and goes through the whole building. There it is. Sure, hold on a second. I'll just... Okay, we'll just pick it up from here. Okay, there's the parallel line. Yeah. Going right down the hall. This is a very uh, wonderful stock room. Okay, I guess that. Yes. Sure. Why don't, you, why don't you just shut down for now? Here is the same design, same model receiver bag like Tesla had in the uh, penthouse that was in such bad shape. Fortunately, I recognized the receivers that Tesla had, documented what he had what changes, if any, were made, and these are identical to them. Yeah. But these, turns out, were designed directly by Tesla for RCA. These were used by RCA Communications, Inc., or today it's RCA Global Communications. Okay. These were used for overseas transatlantic transmissions, you know, broadcasts, to pick up the receive on. How many of these uh, did he have against the wall in the penthouse, and which penthouse was it in? It was in the one I only saw it in New York. Okay. I understand there was more equipment in the penthouse at one time on the Wardorf, but it was gone long ago because the Wardorf was remodeled long ago. But he had three of these up against one wall. Okay. But they looked like kids had come in, stolen everything out of them. They were battered, they were bashed, there was very dirt all over them. Yes. And you can see these are in good shape. These are very good shape, yeah. Okay. And these receivers are designed very uniquely. Can you tell us something about that? Well, I'll have to get very, very technical. You want me to go technical? A little bit. Well, essentially, the layout of the coils is very unusual, very symmetrical. Instead of using resistors for the uh, bypassing of the different elements of the tubes, they use coils. And each coil, each set of bypass coils, is, list is located under the main coil in a triangular pattern, so that the coil the main coil makes up like a tip, and the triangular makes up sort of like a very weird triangular shape. Almost like a psychogenerative shape? Right. Okay. And that, I believe, is the secret of these receivers. All right. They were actually implementing um, psychotronic principles, I guess. Yes. And the well, signals... Tesla was very... He, he knew what he was doing with the psychotronics. Okay. Yes, now he had tried... And I don't have any of these hooked up, but if I was able to turn these on, you wouldn't believe the fidelities these have. Okay. These have fantastic fidelities. Yeah. These will pick up Europe without fading, for instance. These in front of us here. Yeah. 
uh, Tesla was working on a system of psychotronic type television mm -hmm. and um, I believe that um, Tom Brown has information on this he yeah, sent me a copy mm -hmm. well he did send me a copy out of the I think it was a Tesla was Kansas on Star of newspaper of unusual functions yeah well, I guess we got enough of that. Okay, this is very good. Thank you, Preston. Shall we go look at the tape recorder? Sure. Um, this is a remnant or a relic or a carcass of a RCA new orthophonic tape recorder. This was used by RCA Records a lot and by NBC. The old Victory at Sea recording was made on something similar to this. Not the first one. The first one was on Ampex 200. The later one that was done in 57 and 59, where they made the phonograph record, Victory at Sea, was recorded on one of these. This is identical circuitry-wise, if not a little bit poor, to a uh, Ampex 300. The secret of this recorder is not the machine or the electronics under here, but the case. Yes. The case is an organ accumulator. Just stick your hand in there. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> okay. We'll look down into the mouth of the beast. Just stick your hand in the mouth of the beast. Feel oh, it feels cool. The feel, feel all the energy down there? Yeah, it's cool. There's a coolness inside. And if I stick my hand, you know it's going to change everything to you. Yes. It stopped buzzing. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a, you put there your was hand a tingling sensation at the fingertips. You put your hand in the amplifier compartment, too, down below. Okay, That's we'll empty. look down here. Oh, yeah, you feel it immediately. See, the secret of this was they bathed the, ener they bathed the uh, tape recorder in psychic energy. The entire device was bathed in orgone? Yep. Okay. Even the capstair motor is the same as a 300, except they got this odd little idler over here. Yeah, another idler that is not in the 300. Okay. So this is essentially an orgone box. It's wooden on the outside? Mm-hmm. And steel and or just metal. iron? It's the steel. And you can see the steel down in here. I see. Okay. Now you had an experience with this. Well, down in here. I see. Okay. Now you had an experience with this while bringing it back. Yeah, sorry? I picked this up from the estate of an old, older gentleman in Manhattan that died, and we put this in the car myself and the associate. And I drove this back from Manhattan, and by the time I reached the Nassau County line, I felt like I was drunk. I was able to drive <laughs> all right, but I just felt higher than a kite. Okay. I was just overloaded with energy. As this thing ran along, it just accumulated more and more energy, and it was screaming by the time I got <laughs> home. <laughs> That's good. Better than nutrients, almost. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm feeling uh, a very powerful emanation coming off of this uh, magnet head in front of us. I feel sort of like a signal, like, beaming out. Uh, that, that's the erase head. The record and play head are missing from this, as okay. well as the spooling motors are missing. Okay, so maybe there's something to be said about magnets and orgone boxes. You Who mentioned knows? something. They've, uh, a lot of people have put magnets in orgone boxes. And what seems to be the effect? It seems to magnify it. Okay. You were saying before that you believe that odylic energy and orgone energy might just w as well be the same type of thing? Yeah, I think it's the same thing. Okay. That's interesting. Some people have expressed the views that there are uh, slight variants of one another mm -hmm. or different resonances. Resonances can be different. The frequency content can be different. Right. You've talked often about uh, groups of frequencies. Mm -hmm rather than specific peak frequencies. Let's go in where we can sit down. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Should we just... Uh, well, there's that antenna again. Very powerful. Okay. Do you want to do products first or products afterwards? Uh, let's talk about the history first, okay. and then we'll introduce the excellent product. Good. Okay, Preston. Well, we're now in 
you get light in the room. It's, there's a latch on the door. Okay. So you can just turn it. Right there. Okay. And then you lean up against the door. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We are now in the demo room of Preston Space Time Laboratory. This is where we demonstrate to the public our products, essentially. You know, Jerry wanted to discuss the idea of Wilhelm Reich and Mr. Moray and those people. Let's first go into the Moray function. As everybody knows, if you don't know, you're going to know now, T. Henry Moray was a Ph.D. worked in Salt Lake City, Utah most of the time. He was in, you know, Chicago. He was in New York. But his main home base was Salt Lake City. What he's famous for is a number of things. The most famous thing that he had was a uh, so-called free energy device. The reason I say so-called because it isn't really free. He's still tapping the energy from an energy source, being the ether. The ether is believed today to be positron-electron pairs, where the positrons come into our reality and destroy themselves with the electrons. And this comes in as a scattered function, almost like Brownian motion, and generates a chaotic background of energetic noise. If you can cohere this background of energetic noise, you can tap immense amounts of power out of this. Reportedly, the Russians have done this uh, 30, 40 years ago. This is one of the things Tesla was saying that. But reportedly, Moray made this box. It looked like an old three-dial, old-time 20s radio. An old three-dialer, we call it. He would tune the thing up, he did it with the detector in it, and he could light up three to five thousand watts worth of light bulbs, toasters, whatever. This, of course, was in the 20s and 30s we're talking. And he challenged the leading physicists to come out and find the power source. No one was able to find the power source. My professor at Polytech, where I went to school, when he was a student, he went with his professor out to Moray Laboratory and tore the thing apart. And that man told me definitely the thing worked. They don't know how or why it worked, but it worked. And it wasn't a fake. They even took it out in the middle of the desert where there was no power line. Because it was suggested that it was picking up induced uh, magnetic fields from the power line, or electric fields. So they took it like 50 miles away from any power line and still produced electricity very nicely. This, of course, is what the fringe science people know of T. Henry Moray. Of course, he was much more active. If you dig a little deeper into the fringe science, you'll find out he was active in uh, medical devices, and he had his medical devices and his medical applications. Yeah. Of course, his medical tube patent actually is a tube that was in his free energy device. Moray essentially developed vacuum tubes. That was one of his specialties. He developed a coal emitter tube where the cathode that emitted the electrons was essentially built with radioactive substances. Uh, the radiation itself would knock the electrons out of the metal and you get an emission without a filament. He had true coal cathode vacuum tubes. He built a radio receiver that uh, reportedly needed no power to run it. It would drive a speaker at a nice level. Whether this worked off of the power of the local radio station, or he actually had a free energy device in the radio, no one really knows for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, what is very little known about T. Henry Moray is where did he get his money? Mm -hmm. He essentially was a consultant to the radio field. In the 30s, all the people who were in the radio field were looking for an edge to sell their receivers, their radios, to the public. Everybody at War to the radio or maybe <coughs> the power output stage was 16 tubes and push-pull parallel. More tubes, the better. Mm -hmm. And you had these giant mammoth radio chassis just covered with tubes. Half of them did nothing. But you had this genius that would go around to different radio companies and say, hey, I can design you a more superior radio. He'd show a few of his little trinkets here and there, and he was hired. The first radio company, to my knowledge, that hired 
Mr. Moray, D. Henry Moray, was the E. H. Scott Radio Laboratory, not H. H. Scott. Most everybody's familiar with H. H. Scott. That was the Scott up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that manufactured audio equipment and hi-fi equipment in the late 40s to the early 70s when they sold to a Japanese company. I'm talking E. H. 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 was Herman Holzner Scott. E. H. was Elmer Holzner Scott. I've heard reported that they're either brothers or they're cousins, I'm not sure which. Although E. A. Scott was a lot older than H. A. Scott. But it's the same middle name and the same last name. This fellow started out with the Scott Transformer Company. He started to build some very high quality radios in the 20s. In the 30s, he came up with these grand consoles that were home plated. In the 30s, these things sold for like $3,000 a piece, which was the price of a house back then. He was aiming this at the rich and the wealthy. He put on his advertising, if you can tolerate anything else, don't buy a Scott. Now, he hired Moray to design him a superior receiver. And Moray developed for him what was known as the Scott Imperial which later became the Scott Philharmonic. The Philharmonic and the Imperial, the coil structures are identical in it, with the Moray coils. He did some very unusual things from the viewpoint of engineering. He came up with a radio that would pick up Europe without interference, didn't fade, and high fidelity quality. You could tune in, you could sit out here in Long Island. I have a Scott Philharmonic in my house and an Imperial. I can tune in uh, <coughs> New York radio stations and they sound like that on them. They're that clean. Of course, Scott went a long ways on the Moray designs. And he then traveled to Hamill Manufacturing in New York. Scott did his design work in the early 30s. In the mid-30s, he traveled to Hamill Manufacturing and designed the original Super Pro. That had a lot of common coil structures as to the uh, Scott receivers. Then he went to work for Fisher Raymon coil structures as to the uh, Scott receivers. Then he went to work for Fisher Radio Company and designed the famous uh, Fisher Model 50 amplifier, which of course resembled a Hamelin amplifier and resembled a Scott amplifier. I wonder why. Mm -hmm. And all my designs here are still based on that early Moray design for my audio amps. I still use the same as any. Moray was one of the first ones to realize that you had to drive a 6 out 6 through a low impedance transformer driver. When you got that, you got a uh, phase conjugate laser bouncing laser effect between the driver transformer and the output transformer. The relativistic signal went both ways between the two transformers. And of course, we bounce from input to output, we get an amplification, but also relativistically, you got an amplification when you went from the output and the input of the two. And this signal just kept bouncing between these two barriers, these transformers. And it kept building up more and more relativistic function. This, so, uh, if you'll pardon me for, uh, for interrupting, this reminded me just now of the, uh, the Farnsworth multi-factor tube. Mm -hmm. where you had this reflectivity going back and forth. Yeah, you got the same thing with photomultipliers. Right, yeah. photomultipliers, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. This is fascinating. Then, of course, Mr. Moray went to work for the government again. And that's when everything went under the carpet for secrecy. Okay. What was he involved in, as far as you know? He designed a lot of very strange etheric receivers for the military. I haven't been able to get even any soft proof for this, but I've had one individual tell me that he worked at Fort Mama in the 50s. And that he did, you know, worked at Fort Mama Signal for laboratories. Mm -hmm. The big radio laboratory at Fort Mama. I'm still looking further into this, trying to get more witnesses that can verify, yeah, there was a madman that talked of radiant energy and talked of free energy. This had something See, to my, do with my uh, investigation procedures on this is to find older people who are retired that work for these different companies and ask them, do you have any strange characters coming to the company? 
And I asked the man that retired from E.A. Scott, very old man. He said, oh yeah, we've had this fellow, he described him, who came in and talked about free energy and radiant energy. Now, it wasn't Tesla. And I started to gather E.H. Scott paraphernalia. Scott put out like a little monthly form. And who was pictured in one of those poems? C. Henry Moray. He's there, bare face, right out in the open. You can recognize him. He and E.H. Scott were sitting side by side doing something in the laboratory, one of the pictures. And I got almost identical story from a person retired from uh, Hamilton in New York. Can you um, tell more about the etheric uh, receivers? I mean, we know a little bit about this thing. It's essentially how you wind the coils, the material you make the coils out of, how much voltage you put on the vacuum tubes. That's the key. How the chassis are laid out. The signal's got to flow through the receiver. Yes, this, we saw this in the Tesla receiver. We right. saw it. The signal seems to go right through it yeah. effortlessly. The uh, the etheric receiver of uh, Moray seemed to be almost like a dowsing instrument because yeah. you didn't need a microphone. Or like a radionics instrument. Yeah, because you could laterally scan the earth and pick a point and listen in on conversations without a microphone, apparently. Well, this is one of the things Moray claimed. Okay. I don't know, I don't think any of the commercial receivers he designed had that capability. No. Although a psychic could probably use almost any receiver that has vacuum tubes and it was laid out properly to do that. Yes. As the psychic can use a radionics instrument that's designed and laid out properly. Also, these instruments have to be built in special ways. It's very important what is the assembly person thinking of as they're building it. As you build the receiver physically, you're building a psychic image in that uh, equipment. Okay. This is why you'd rather have a car that was built on Wednesday than one that was built on Monday or Friday. If I was built on Monday, then you're working thinking, oh God, it's Monday, I've got the whole week to go through. And Friday, they want to get out of there quick, and they're putting both, both days, they're putting in negative images. But Wednesday, they're just about settled down to do the proper thing. This is well known. That's because the image they put in the car is a vastly superior image to what's put in on Monday and Friday. Now these uh, images, uh, by the way, um, can also uh, imprint themselves in stone sure. with a oh high yeah. metallic content. Oh yeah. And so this or represents, of course. Yeah. So this represents a new way of storing um, information. information. And if somebody could because we were discussing like that, the transmitters. Yes. One transmitter had a lot of information stored with it. The other one didn't. Yes, absolutely. We're still wondering why. Yeah. Absolutely. And what's the difference? I still can't tell you. A lot of people thought that Moray's uh, sound receiver was just a microphone and a very good amplifier, which was unheard of at the time. And I just don't believe that. I don't buy that. I don't think he had a microphone on it. I think it was just some kind it of. It would just pick up the sound. ambient noise. Yeah, that's that's um, that's pretty remarkable. You have to get over the ambient noise, away from the ambient noise locally to hear outside. The CIA has been trying to do this for years. Right. They've had the big dishes, the big ears. Now the Rogers uh, people uh, who were uh, associating themselves with uh, Thomas uh, Hieronymus also had a dowsing device which was able to scan across the earth laterally. Uh, well, that was, that was Hieronymus more than Rogers. Okay, well, uh, is this the same Rogers as designed the antenna? Yeah. Okay, it's no coincidence. Though. No, it's Larry Rogers, Larry H. Rogers. Okay, quite a remarkable device. They were looking for ore samples uh, across the ground. I mean, the idea of scanning across the Earth uh, betrays uh, a lot more than ordinary electrodynamics, doesn't it? Okay. Well, it goes in the form of electrodynamics. Okay. Um, would you uh, continue talking about, uh, let's say, uh, the relationship of Thomas Moray, Tesla, and possibly Wilhelm Reich? Well, Moray and Tesla, we have not been able to find a connection between them. There definitely is a connection between Wilhelm Reich and both men. Because Wilhelm Reich had C. Henry Moray early, like in the 20s and the 30s, designing for him. In the 40s, he went over to RCA and had Mr. Tesla designing for him. 
when I bought those RCA receivers from the estate of another gentleman that died, mm -hmm. I found literature, letters back and forth between that gentleman and T. Henry Moray for RCA. I mean, uh, Wilhelm Wright for RCA, making those big receivers into organ receivers. See, Wright was a medical doctor. He wasn't a scientist. He wasn't a physicist or an engineer. He had to hire somebody to do his engineering for him. And he had some very brilliant engineers up there with him. So we're talking about, uh, in all of this, we've been talking about uh, extracting functions out of energetic beams. Mm -hmm. Um, which are not necessarily weaker, but just as powerful, but perhaps not received by certain configurations. Mm -hmm. True. So the engineers of the 40s and 50s perhaps were uh, eliminating some of these vitalistic functions. Well, in the mid 30s, yes. radio, which is today electronics was at a point where if it worked, they used it before the mid 30s. In other words, a lot of people came in, gee, that sounds like a great idea, let's try it. So they tried. And what they would do is, if something worked, they incorporated it. By about the mid-30s, the physicists were starting to get a handle on Hertzian waves, how they work. And we got the idea of engineering modeling by the mid-30s. You work all out mathematically, you wouldn't do it empirically. Before the mid-30s, everything was developed empirically. That's why you saw some of the strangest stuff in the layouts in the old, old radios. Right. That's, that's my interest in the old, old radios, is what did they do and why. They had things as binocular coils, cancel field, cancel field coils, they had strange capacitor assemblies. And somebody found they worked better. They didn't know why they worked better, but they worked better. They used them, they patented them, and they used them. But by the mid-30s, the physicists and the engineers are able to say, okay, here's the mathematics that shows you what's going on inside of the radio. And they got to a point where they were more concerned did it make sense mathematically or whether or not it worked. Okay. So we then got away from side of the radio. And they got to a point where they were more concerned did it make sense mathematically or whether or not it worked. Okay. So we then got away from these unknown functions and these functions were not understood and went to more of the known understandable functions also, these known and understandable functions are much more predictable. It took a lot of tinkering with a lot of these weird designs to get them to work the way they should. With the known functions, you go on a production line, build a thousand radios, and maybe only lose ten of them. With these weird functions, you might build a thousand, you'd be lucky if you get eight hundred of them to work. And this is what Moray was uh, talking about with his tubes, that so few of them actually work. Yeah coherent dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Well, he also probably had, uh, you know, uh, tolerance troubles. If yeah. he had the modern capability we have today of making high tolerance machine parts, he probably could have gotten much, he could have defined it and gotten any more, you know, much higher yield out of his production. It also seems to me that those early researchers starting from right after the American Civil War, I mean, we're, we're hearing a lot of uh, feedback on uh, certain people like Nathan Stubblefield's telephone, uh, longitudinal telephone transmitters, and uh, oh, Malon Loomis. Yeah. See, Malon Loomis was another a fellow who uh, was developing uh, teletransmissions uh, way back using kites and just uh, telephone receivers plugged into the ground. And he claimed that an electrical uh, layer in the atmosphere was yeah, powering was the Tesla's whole thing. Idea. Right, this is a long time solution. before Tesla. Yeah. Yeah. So it just seems to me, uh, if I can interject, that the the earlier researchers were moving into a very powerful and fluid um, discovery field, and then uh, somehow this was all choked off by the engineers. Yeah. Okay. Could you tie in uh, now uh, with uh, Reich? What happened uh, with your discoveries with Reich? Well, what you're talking of is the information base I have on him. Yes. I was up at a ham fest. That's a ham radio flea market up at Deerfield, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And I was walking down, these things are usually rows, aisles of 
a guy sawing out of the back of his car and just sort of, you know, it's like any other saw here. The little guy comes and dumps his junk. And what, I was walking down one of the rows, and I saw an Argon box sitting on the ground. I looked at it, is this really an Argon box? I thought, really? So I said to the guy, how much you want for this thing? And he said, give me two dollars for it. <laughs> so I say, well, what, anything else here, come with it. He pointed to about five pieces of electronic equipment from the thirties and said, yeah, those came with it. And what do you want for all of it? Give me twenty dollars for the whole mess. So I gave him the twenty dollars and packed up and packed the all in my car. And I said, well, where did this come from? And I, I said, where does it come from? Is there any more of it? I'd like to buy more of this if you can find more of it. He says, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you where it, where it came from. He told me of a used furniture dealer, Saka Rangeley, that he got it out of one of the back buildings in the used furniture place. This was a Saturday. About 1 o'clock I got this out of the fella. Mm -hmm. And I called up the used furniture dealer. He was still open and he'll wait for me. So I made it up the range very fast that afternoon. Yeah, I guess so. And <laughs> I introduced myself, so I was calling up here on the phone, and uh, they're saying you got a pile of electronic junk up here. He says, Yeah, the whole back building full of it. So he takes me out there and shows me this whole small building, about 20 by 30 feet, just filled with this stuff. So I say to the fellow, how much? He tells me a figure, very cheap. So I write him a check. Mm -hmm. And I load up my van with the first load and bring it home. Second time I went up there, I said, I thought, where did this all come from? He says, no secret, don't tell me. He said, up in Rangeley, there was a house filled with this stuff. The attic was filled, the basement was filled with this stuff. Mm -hmm. But to continue the story, towards the end, I found only in the back corner a stack of notebooks about that tour. They turned out to be Wilhelm Wright notebooks. And of course, I brought them home. The story I've been able to piece together, talking with the used furniture dealer, is that apparently Mr. Wright in the 50s, when he was in trouble. He knew he was in trouble. He couldn't tell the court, the judge, what he was doing because of a secret. It was all classified. He knew he was going to end up in jail. So apparently he took a lot of the secret stuff that he considered to be proprietary and put it in the house that was leased to his assistant. He didn't own it. So the government didn't know of it. And when he died, this house stayed fallow for about 15 years. And then whoever owned it reverted back to the owner, and they wanted to refurbish the house, so they called this used furniture dealer in and said, uh, clean the house out. Okay. And this guy carted all this stuff back. Curiosities. Yeah. Uh, are you at liberty to say what kind of devices you found? Well, there was about a dozen orgone accumulators, from small ones to something you just sit in like the size of refrigerators. He had electronic equipment, I still don't know what it is. I'm still trying to figure it out. Okay. Uh, were there any devices attached to the orgone accumulators, electronic devices? There was connectors on them, but I haven't found anything that fits those connectors in the file. Anything on the orgone motor? I don't know. Okay. Maybe some of the devices, some of the electronic devices were for the organ motor, I don't know. See, Reich in the later years went heavily into electronics. He was experimenting with uh, door busting uh, for, you know, the government and other people, or door busting the atmosphere and all this kind of stuff, which we'll go into a little bit. Yeah. And he went very heavily into electronics. Okay. This, of course, is common knowledge, and he went into electronics. Well, he himself knew nothing of it, I guess he learned some. 
Uh, how is this um, correlating to Nikola Tesla now, known as Nikola Turbo? Uh, Turbo Tesla was working mostly in communications equipment. Okay. This RCA communications, what were they interested in? Communications equipment. Well, of course, at that same time, uh, Reich was trying to get the RCA group designing an organ receiver. Yes. And Tesla was involved in that. Whether he ever got it, I don't know. Although the big RCA receivers I have here, there were sections of those receivers up in, in the Ranger okay. in that house. There were sections of them. Was there but any they were highly modified. Mm, yes. Was there any known uh, communications between the two? Did they ever communicate uh, directly? The, the communications I know of, know of was letters from a particular engineer in RCA to Wright. I don't know if there was any direct communication between Tesla and Wright. Wright may have went to RCA because they had Tesla in their employee. I don't know. I see. Okay. Uh, then there was, of course, that interesting uh, bit of folklore concerning Tesla's uh, supposed death in the 40s yeah. and how he was secreted to London. Yeah, we believe it was London. Okay. And he died when? In the 50s? At some point? Late 50s, early 60s. Now, this was done ostensibly because he was working on etheric physics yeah, for them? I don't know what he was working on. He was working on Stan, he was working for Stanley Electric and uh, RCA Limited. Okay. We've seen these split between the two companies. Of course, this is very soft evidence we have for this. Very sure. soft. Right. The, uh, We're still looking for more proof of it, if any. Okay. Well, some of the proof could be inferred. The fact that his body was, quote unquote, discovered by a maid. No one else saw the body. Secondly, a sealed casket. Sealed casket. Yep. Um, secondly, the fact that his That's longevity the can be faked. It can be faked. Yes, absolutely. The longevity factor. I mean, his his family line mm -hmm. seemed to live a very long time. Right. Okay, let's uh, get back to uh, Wilhelm Reich now and door busting electronically. Maybe uh, well, fill us in. in the late forties, early to late forties, Reich had two or three laboratories around the country. He had one up in Maine, he had one in Santa somewhere in Arizona, and he had one in Los Angeles. And these were essentially weather laboratories. He have gotten very heavily into organ building up accumulators and door busting the organ motor, this sort of thing. What you're referring to that I know of is the basis of one of my products I'm putting out from Preston Space Time Laboratories. Mr. Wright contacted the government in about 47, 48, we're not sure when, maybe 46 even, and told them, hey, I got a little device that if you send it up to the atmosphere, it will take the violence out of the storm. Of course, the government's interested, so they tell them, send the prototype out to uh, Brookhaven the National Laboratories in, uh, up in New York, you know, which is right up maybe 10 miles that way. Okay. This is as per a retired PhD from Brooke Kipps at work on the project, mm -hmm. this story. Mm -hmm. So they get this little cardboard box and they send it up on a meteorological balloon. And they wait for a thunderstorm to be heading towards. And they send it up and the thunderstorm splits and goes around them. <laughs> they do this a number of times and they realize, yes, he's got something. Mm -hmm. The thought they develop eventually, from what I understand, is they got the idea if they send enough of these things up and punched enough holes in the weather front that they could actually dissolve the weather front. Mm -hmm. So then a device known as a radio sun changed its uh, characteristics. It became a doorbuster. Okay. The original AMT2 radio songs were the Wilhelm Wright transmitter with his two sensors. He developed a sensor, an antenna, a little antenna, that picked up the organ energy in phase, and he developed another one that picked up the door energy out of phase. All these little boxes.
Rex is dead. Is they sequentially connected the organ and the door sensors in a sequence. The well, idea being when the door sensor was connected, it reduced the door components, and then when the organ sensor was connected, it built up the organ component to replace the door component. And then he had another position of input, another input to the transmitter cleared the transmitter. He had a nice little transmitter. This was uh, now an electronic version of the, of, of the cloud buster or the DOR buster. Right, right which required water ground. Mm -hmm. This okay. didn't require ground. Now where did this uh, do door go? In other words, did it go into the vacuum? Did it sink into the zero into the point? Vacuum. We're now speculating. Right. It was probably <coughs> pulled into the vacuum of the transmitter and dissipated. Yeah. Okay. Don't know for sure whether it was or not. Okay. But it probably was. That's pretty mysterious. Yes. Yeah. I'm willing to admit, I don't fully understand how the system works. Okay. Now, the government for years uh, concealed this fact. Oh, yeah. They just called it uh, radio science. They said it was a package that gathered information about the weather and transmitted it back to the Earth. There's a number of peculiar things here. First of all, they had sent hundreds of these things in the air every day from the ships at sea, airports, weather centers, whatever you want to put it. Yes. And these things had a radio range of maybe a hundred miles, maybe. They didn't go far. They only transmitted about a half a watt of uh, radio power, you know, or heard you power to call it in the sciences. Now, I have seen radio songs, radio song transmitters all over the surplus market. In the 60s, those things, you could get them anywhere. You walk down the old Canal Street or Portland Street in Manhattan, you get barrels of radio sounds out in front of these stores. Mm -hmm. I have never, ever seen a radio sound receiver known as a radio sound receptor. I've never seen one. Curious. And I've also, all my friends that are in the collecting business, I only know one who has ever seen a receiver. What does that tell us? Very strikingly. If they <laughs> had used these things all over the place, what did they receive them on? <laughs> these things should be as common as the BC-348 uh, Army receiver was, I mean, the Army aircraft receiver, or the little ARC-5 boxes. They should have been as common as those. <laughs> they should have been everywhere. But no. And another interesting thing, you talk to the companies that got contracts. The government awarded contracts to build radio sound receivers. Only thing is, three, four months after they awarded the contracts, they pulled them. Okay. Curious again. Servo Corporation built them. Universal <coughs> Manufacturing is going to build them. Okay. All these small companies were then on these radio sound projects. Would you? Tell us um, a little about the characteristics of the output of the radio sound. Well, let's uh, continue more on security. Oh, fine. Because we're not okay. finished with the security yet. Oh, okay. All right, another thing that they did, the main tube that's in the transmitter, the carrier oscillator, they listed the number of the tube in the RCA tube manual, but they told you in the tube manual the thing only lasts a few hours. Curious. I I've had radio sound tubes running here for two hours, two thousand hours or more. That was another way to keep people from using the tubes. The hand would not build something with a tube that only lasts a few hours. Now, the transmitter essentially is a pulse modulated transmitter. It's a CW oscillator where it's pulsed off. As the tube oscillates, the stores in the etheric component when it's pulsed off, the etheric component is pushed out to the antenna. This is about as much as I understand on how the thing works. I'm willing to admit, although I'm making a product with it, the basic transmitter I don't fully understand. I know how to replicate it, that's about it. I don't understand why they did some of it. And that's this right here. This is a copy from the radio song, this white bottle. This actually is out of a radio song. 
This is what we call, I'll put the whole thing in my lap, a biosound. Sound, of course, means sounding. Bio means bi biological. This is sounding, transmitting to a biological system. That's what we're aiming this at. Biological, of course, is uh, intimating an intelligence. This is meant to transmit the intelligence of anything. If you go by Hindus, they believe even a rock has an intelligence, although it takes a rock maybe 10,000 years to generate a thought, but still it's there. What this is, this is essentially the transmitter. This can be a standalone device. You turn this on, you set this up, this will put up a shield that will block out psychic influences and psychic reading. This is now so much psychobabble to the people who don't believe in this stuff. You connect this in here, but you now got as a radionics broadcaster. Let me put this over here. And then can we look at this? Yeah. This way? First, let me untangle the tangle of wires. I can tell you right now that that object is very, very active at the point. Mm -hmm. It seems to pull in um, the etheric signal and just it emit it. Sends it, out. it sends it right out here. Right above mm -hmm. here, there's a very powerful piercing mm -hmm. a line. It's a lot more powerful than anything I've felt over a quartz uh, crystal. Mm -hmm. Well, in a few minutes, we'll show you Very what the side knows. Very active. This is our input well. Okay. I'm not going to go into here what is radionics. Here, what is radionics? I'm sure you've had radionics on your programs, and your audience knows what radionics is. Yes. This is built like the input well of a typical radionics device. You got coils. You can see them in here. See the windings? Yes. Okay. Copper ones. Yeah. And you got a star pattern down in the bottom. You can see you, that? Can you aim that at us? Yeah. See the star pop pattern down Let's in see. here? Yes. That's the that that's an antenna. Okay. This is essentially now you can just focus on the thing in general. This is essentially a coil. You got me? Yeah. This is a coil wound this way. Another coil wound transverse around that coil. The star on the bottom is like an antenna that's connected to a specially designed radio receiver. Okay. The output of these go to the transmitter. Whatever you put in here, the energetic component or the relativistic or the psychic wave component will be picked up, sensed, and sent out to the transmitter yeah. and broadcast it. That's all it does. Whatever is in the well whatever is put here will be out. sent out. Uh, if you put your hand in the well, it will transmit back to you through the radionics witnessing effect. I see. Which is a resonance. Now, where is the location to which it all networks in? I mean, will it uh, strike into the etheric matrix somehow? Oh, yeah. It'll just relate it itself? It goes right into the timeline. Okay. Because this is a time stress transmitter. This okay. is a potential scalar and a time stress transmitter. It puts out about a half a watt of uh, Hertzian power or radio power. Okay. It puts out about 50 watts potential power and about 250 watts of time stress is what this little thing puts out. Now, you'll notice there's a thing plugged into the side of this. Yes. This is a prototype for this, of course. This is the final product here. If you hold this in your hand, this has Wilhelm Reich's orgone sensor in it. When you turn the switch on, you close the box. You now put yourself in the circuit of an orgone box. And through the transmitter, it's like sitting in an orgone box. Why? Let's, let's look also at another part of this. Sure. Uh, bumble fingers. Can you speak more uh, at some point about what's in your hand? Yes. Okay. Let's consider this. Can you get a close-up of this sandwich here? Sure. You got the sandwich? Yep. What we got here? We got paper. The dark stuff is steel. In wood. What does that make? It's an accumulator. 
And this is all around. This whole thing sit, is sitting in an orgone box. If you close the lid, it's now a closed orgone box. If you hold the sensor, it connects you into the coil. It connects you into the orgone box. Okay. Which then starts a flow between you, the sensor, the orgone box, and the transmitter. Right. It's like you're sitting in an orgone box. You don't need something the size of a refrigerator. <laughs> okay. You use one of these. What, what is the sensor itself? Can you say, or rather not? The sensor. Yeah, let me go in the other room and get some toys. Why don't you put that on pause? Yes. What's in here is essentially what's in this little vial. This is the actual orgone sensor as designed by Wilhelm Reich. The original version, of course, was a lot bigger. This is a lot smaller. This is a plastic plate with silvered edges with a deposit of this black stuff. We don't know what it is. The two chemistry labs so far have not been able to analyze this for us. We don't know what it is. We're waiting to get use of a spectrophotometer. Okay. You can see if we can find out what this black stuff is. According to the government line, this is a humidity sensor, which it is. If you breathe on it, the resistance goes up. It's not salt, because if you breathe on a salt compound, the conductivity goes up, not the resistance. It means the resistance goes down, but this goes up. This is opposite from a salt. Right. This is what's in here. It sits just like that, and no, it sits like that in here. It sits like that. Okay. This is the organ sensor. Now we'll go to the door sensor. Are these commercially available? I think they are. But I have loads of them. Okay. Let's here. This little white rod is what's known as in the business as a thermistor. Yes. This is a carbon rod. This one has traces of gold, silver, platinum, rubidium, and other stuff in it. Okay. Yes. This is a little white, this is a rod thermistor. They call this in the government line the temperature sensor. This changes its resistance with temperature. <coughs> but this is also an antenna for the door component. This picks up the door component out of phase. We don't have this incorporated into the biosign yet, this unit, this little widget. How this works, we don't know. How the organ sensor works, we don't know. When did uh, Wilhelm Reich develop that sensor system? About the 40s. This is when he moved into electronics. Yeah. The transmitter comprises of two parts. The modulation oscillator. You can see it's got a coil. It's got a little vacuum tube in it. And the actual transmitter, of course, this you should recognize from over there. This is the same as here. This is what's in it. Okay. Let's focus on that uh, yeah. con, the goal of the antenna. This is the transmitter right here, these two pieces. This one here is the carrier oscillator with a very unusual antenna. It resembles a conical antenna, but I'm not quite sure what it is. But of course, what was... Yeah, 
What was Mr. Reich into? Sexuality, <coughs> orgasms, what does this resemble? Resembles a phallic symbol. Especially this piece here re resembles the male, the male phallic symbol. On television, I don't want to say more about it. Um, as a cavity oscillator, is this the antenna function? Well, this is the antenna. This is the actual oscillator, this round thing, the thing that looks like a can. Okay. The little right. can has the tube and the cavity in it. Right. Okay. And this here is the secondary modulator. This here is the primary modulator. These two pieces make up the transmitter. This is the modulation oscillator. This is the carrier oscillator. Yes. Now, exactly why these things do what they do, I don't know. I cannot give you a theory base on this. I'm trying to derive the theory base on this. How this thing actually generates 250 watts etheric power, I wish I knew, but I don't. Sounds a little like an activity of free energy. Quote it may be. Free energy. So called, yeah. yeah. It, it, it involves the ether, no question. This is the product we're pushing right now. Is it possible to make a demonstration of the, uh, the biosond and demonstrate uh, what it does? In what we're going to do is we're going to set this thing on the floor. Turn it on the transmit. And what will happen is it will transmit. It will transmit a signal. Yes. Which I can pick up with this little box. Okay. Here's the first set, so that's it. Uh, you see, it follows circular around the transmitter. Now, there's nothing in here that should cause that dead zone. If it's standing waves, they're going to be in quarter wavelengths and they'd be about that far apart. Let's uh, show them the dead zone again because it sounds, uh, what you're hearing is as you're going away from the antenna, you're hearing fade outs. Yeah. You got deep ones separated by this bar. Then you got to go that distance. Right. That's much more than a wavelength, even. Absolute dead That's spots. That's about five wavelengths. Absolute dead spots. That's saying that it's solitons. Because here's the boundary. Here's one boundary. Here's one boundary. And you see the solitons are going on in hemispherical circles. Now, if it was to this room, the shape of the circle, the, this circle that I'm tracing out, would be distorted. Yes. If it was in this room. But it isn't. It's a nice yeah. circular shape. By the way, this is a broadband detector. This we also mark it. This will pick up from uh, about 100 kilohertz to 2 gigahertz. This is transmitting at 1680 megahertz or 1.6 gigahertz. Okay. These uh, solitons I find very fascinating. And uh, you mentioned before that you feel that they, they find ground. They look for ground or they, they come up from the ground? I don't know. Okay. We're all speculating at this point. Okay. 
All right, I noticed the effect while this thing was on. <laughs> uh, it seemed to wipe my thoughts clean. Just really wipe my thoughts clean. Uh, all negative feelings seem to be dispersed very rapidly, effortlessly. Well, the thing will do door busting. It's almost just like niacin. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like a mild niacin rush. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A cool feeling, though. Niacin generates a warmth factor. This generates a cool feeling. Okay. We just have a play quietly in the background. Okay. Now this is another phase of your research, yep. uh, Preston, which uh, I've been exposed mm -hmm. to and I've been very impressed by. You want to tell us about this and uh, okay. its development, its implications? This is what it looks like, a stereo system. It has two signal sources, a processor, an equalizer, amplifier, speakers. Right now we're playing uh, Tchaikovsky Swan Lake. In fact, most of you know this one from, uh, you know, this is Dracula music. Right. But this is not your everyday, ordinary sound system. True. This is an unusual sound system. The theory base is this. When you make a recording, either everything or nothing records. Of course, your physicist would laugh at you if you said this. How it actually works is Absolutely. we all exist in multi-dimensionality, multi-reference frames, multi-universes. Which means although this recording has on it optically, yeah. Although this recording has on it optically encoded audio information, at the same time, along with this recording, is images and other realities. Okay. Is images and other realities. Yes. Now, this system here is specially designed to pick up this other recording these other images and the other realities of processing. When the musicians perform, they project their biofield at the audience. This is captured in the recording. This equipment is designed to recover that biofield. After the recovery system is complete, it's all vacuum tubes. These amplifier speakers have vacuum tubes in it. You want vacuum tubes to amplify this function. Transistors don't amplify this function all that well. I will show one of those speakers. Uh, Why don't you show this one? That's easier. This one is easier.